put this thing on. All right, people. Get your seat. Revelation number five, we'll pick up in verse number two. We've already had prayer. Good to see everybody. Got a little bigger crowd than we had before. Got some more coming in the back. I'm sure they're fixing some great crisis in the back. Jerry, can you hear me? You reckon the question's too hard? Notice this, verse number two. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? A strong angel is telling making a proclamation, and he's talking to the Apostle John, who's the writer of, of Revelation. And he's also known as a mighty angel in chapter 10 and a mighty angel in chapter 18. But he's asking this, who's got the authority to take the possession of the book? Who's got the authority to break the seals? And so a search is about to ensue throughout heaven, earth, and under the earth. And John knows he can't go no farther. There's nothing to write. There's nothing to know until that book is opened up because that book is the book we read in the book of Revelation that opens up the tribulation, the judgment of God upon the wicked, the end of the world as we know it, and the second coming of Christ with his saints and also the setting up of his kingdom for a thousand years to sit on the throne of David in Jerusalem. And so we find out John doesn't have anything to write because he doesn't have anything to know because the contents and everything that he needs to know is in that book. And until somebody with the authority to come get it from the hand of God the Father sitting on the throne, nobody can move forward. And so John is, the angel is, is making a declaration, who's worthy? He gives an all-out call to whomever that hears the sound of his voice who believes that they're worthy to make their way to the throne of God the Father and take possession of the book. Now, what we got to know is this. Nobody approaches the throne of God the Father. You find the, the seraphims, the cherubims, you find the beast. They rotate the throne as close as they get. But they, not even they have the authority to approach God and take something from His hand. And so now the call goes out and He begins to talk. And who is it that can open the book? Not only open the book, but you know what open the book actually means? to interpret what's in the book. I want to tell you something. You can read Bible all you want to, but until you understand the meaning of the words in the Bible, it's not going to do you a whole lot of good. Because if you don't know the true meaning of the Bible, we put our own thoughts and interpretation of what that definition, what it means, and we could be completely wrong. And you don't want to believe a falsehood. And so John knows that whoever takes that book Whoever opens it also has the authority to interpret what it means, how it means, when it means, and what God's going to be doing. So now there's an all-points search out. Who can break it? Who can open it? Who could begin? Because the tribulation can't begin. And here's the thing about it. God cannot judge the wicked. God cannot allow the tribulation to happen. God cannot do anything until the church and humanity has been warned. God being a righteous judge, you've got to know the consequences, the truth, and the falsehoods before God can judge you, right? If He's a just God. He can't judge you on what you don't know. And so, He can't judge the world and the wicked on the, river, on the revelation, start the tribulation, until the contents are known. And so, John's getting, looking to see who is it that's going to come forward and take this book. There's only one now that can execute the judgments. There's only one that can break the seal. There's only one that can open that book. 
It's not going to be an ordinary human. It ain't going to be Kenneth Copeland. It won't be a demon. It won't be a devil. It won't be a counterfeiter. It will not be a cheap angel. Because this book contains God's secrets right now, and it is a secret book. If all you had in the book of Revelation was blank pages, you wouldn't have a book of anything, would you? Right now, that book that God the Father is holding is a blank book, even though it's written on the inside and the outside, but nobody knows what the words say. That, that God has a book with seven seals on it. So, look at verse number 3. And no man, notice that word. I know we went over the, high, the headlines last week, but and no man in heaven nor in earth nor under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. Does he say one thing, book or books? One. Singular, right? One book. But he also says this, no man. He's specific. Not a spirit being, not an angel, not a seraphim, not a cherubim, not a beast. He's looking at the 24 elders. None of them's come forward. But there's one man that God already knows has the authority, but so far he ain't come forward, and John has not identified him because he ain't come forward yet. But notice this. that To open means to make others understand the book. Does the Bible not specifically say that God calls teachers? Does He call preachers? Does the Bible say that a preacher ought to be apt to teach? Do you know what that absolutely means? That means that He preaches a message or He teaches a lesson. If He can't do it in a way that you can understand what He's saying and glean the truth from the, His words from the book, He ain't teaching. And teaching ain't somebody's opinion. And teaching is different than a message. A message is what God gives you in a collective story about the Scripture. Teaching is when you take the words from the pages of the Word of God, you interpret them, and you teach them to the congregation. That's what teaching is. That's what the scroll is. As the purpose of the scroll is to teach humanity this book of Revelation. But notice, notice this. Why, why a man? Because you see... God don't, number one, God don't want that book open just to look at. Hello. What am I getting at? Dusty Bibles. You know, the ones when the preacher surprises you with a home visit and you're trying to remember where you put the Bible so he can see you got a Bible in the house and you're carrying it down there <laughs> like you're rubbing a lamp hoping a genie pop out. And you know you ain't looked at that Bible in years. And if it wasn't in your way, it'd still be on the coffee pot. You understand it ain't doing you no good. You can have the best study Bible in the world, but if you ain't studying it, it ain't helping you. Notice, why a man and not a spirit being? Give you an easy question. There was one man in heaven at the time of this writing that was also God. Who was it? Jesus? Yes. So, who is it that has the authority to judge humanity? But God, right? God, but Jesus. So, does that not tell you when he says any man that he narrows that down? The only, one, the only man in heaven that had the authority from God the Father to judge humanity would be Jesus. So, that tells you right there, God gave, it, gave the shout out. Nobody qualified for the job until Jesus got up and he did what nobody else could do. He approached his father on the throne. Because you don't ever find in this, in this book that anybody in heaven, the elders, the saints, actually can go up and just touch the Father God. But Jesus can. So he goes up and he takes that away. Notice this. This is what just gets me all angry. There are those in America, around the world, but in America, that teach that Jesus was created. That Jesus was not God, He was simply an angel. 
Because when he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? They said, that's proof positive. Jesus ain't God. The Jehovah's Witnesses. I said a few of them straight here a few Saturdays ago. Bible study Saturday morning. My driveway. They ain't been back. Jesus was begotten. Learn the difference. Born from the bosom of God, not created. Adam was created. Eve was created. Jesus was not created. Angels were created. Jesus always was. He just became flesh through the womb of a virgin named Mary. He is God in the flesh. Amen? The Word became flesh. Back in the book, does it not say the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us? Good, we're straight on that, right? All right then. Look at verse number 4. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, neither to look thereon. Isn't it amazing to you that God picks one man, his disciple John, on the Isle of Patmos to give him everything that he's given him, take him to heaven, give him a play-by-play of the tribulation period, the the second coming of Christ and the the thousand-year reign. I mean, gives it a picture perfect, gives him the words, tells him to write, gives him everything. But he still ain't worthy to approach God the Father and take the book. He don't allow anybody to touch that book because that book cannot be corrupted by anybody, which is why it's got seven seals on it. The only one that can take possession of that book and execute the judgments is the only one that's actually reading the words for the first time out loud. But verse number four, I think I read it. I'm going to tell you, without the book of Revelation, dear friend, we'd have no warning about the end days, would we? We'd have no warning about the judgment to come, how it was going to take place, who it would take place, where and when it would take place. We'd have no idea about the second coming. We'd have no idea about the thousand-year reign of Christ on earth. This book, Revelation, which means a revealing, gives us more information about the end times than any of the Old Testament prophets. It's more clear. And I want to tell you this. We were having a discussion back there in the coffee room. The things that are happening that's going to bring the rapture of the church are either already happened or happening as we speak. Mainly, the world, including America and America's government, is turning on Israel. Meeting with Hamas. Huh? Uh, So that that right there is proof positive we are in the last day, not days. Because you see the whole world lining up right now in line against Israel, including this country. And I don't know what the churches are doing about it. About the same thing they were doing for the Holocaust, pretty much nothing. I'm going to preach about sissy preachers in a minute. Be warned of the tribulation. John shed tears because his heart's broken because he knows something big is going to take place and the only information he's going to have to share with the world is in that book. And so his heart's broken. He knows it's important. But notice this. John's reaction is in real time, but all he saw were the headlines. He could see there was writing on both sides of the page but he had no idea what the content was. Do you understand that's what we get when we get the 6 o'clock news? You get the headlines. You never get the truth. You don't get hardly any facts. And when they do, they spin it to their own story, their own narrative. And so the only source of truth is this Bible. And God, John needs that to have something to write so that we'll know the truth. Remember, this is not the writings of Nostradamus. It's not a psychic. It's not a dream. Can I say this? 
don't, if you're a Christian, don't care what Nostradamus wrote. And if you're a Christian and you're seeing a psychic, you need to be in my office. <laughs> don't be a King Saul and see the witch at Endor to find out what God wants with you. Now, remember, this is not astrology, it ain't witchcraft. John can't open the book, and he cannot guess the content. Do you understand, and listen to me close, Bible study is so important to get into the truth that if you try to guess the truth instead of get the Bible truth, you are wrong and messed up. Look at verse number 5. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book, and to loose the seven seals. Loose the seven seals means that he can conquer. Notice what he says. One of the elders saw Jesus approaching the throne identified him to John as the lion of the tribe of Judah. That's Jesus. The root of David, which means he's following the kingly line of, of King David to rule the world from Jerusalem. But it's Jesus. Now Jesus has always prevailed. What about that time he fasted 40 days and 40 nights? Did he not prevail over the devil in the wilderness with what? The word of God. The Word, same Word we got, quoted Scripture. Notice He defeated uh, the sin at Calvary, shed His blood. Did He not buy us back at Calvary? He prevailed over Calvary. Nobody had ever been hung on the cross and come down that cross of victor, but Jesus did. He prevailed over death in the tomb, did He not? Nobody outside the authority of Jesus Christ ever walked out of a tomb. But Jesus did. Gethsemane, did he not ask his father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me, but if there ain't, give me that cup. He prevailed, even without any help from his own hand-picked disciples, he prevailed at the Garden of Gethsemane in accepting the cup of wrath from God. He prevailed over death and he prevails here, right here in this text. He's the line of the tribe of Judah. He's the root of David, which he's a king. To open means to explain, but not to just to explain. You can get people that God gives the knowledge to explain things. Doesn't give them the right to execute. Let me explain it this way. I have authority from God being a God-called preacher to explain the Bible. I don't, however, have the authority to execute God's judgment on people. That's for God. But with Jesus, not only can He explain these scriptures in this book, but He can execute the, the judgment that's in that book. That's why He's Jesus. He's God. Now, Josh, can you type right quick? I believe you can. The Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse 27. Notice what it says, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Do you understand how it was always going to be Jesus, but John wasn't given that? Uh, can we do Romans chapter 13, verse 4? For he is the minister of God to thee for good, but if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. So do you understand how Jesus has the authority to execute the judgment? There's more, but we'll move on, and we'll go back to Revelation chapter 5 and verse number 6. Notice what he says. And I beheld, 
And lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as if it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Notice this. John is seeing something. And it seems out of context, and it seems out of chronological order, but notice he sees a lamb. Now, we all know that Jesus was the lamb when he came, died for our sins, right? But we also know now he's the king of kings. But John sees him as the lamb because was it not John that saw him at the cross? John saw him beaten. John saw him pour his blood out. John saw him as a slain lamb. So he recognizes Jesus in that role of sacrificial lamb. But notice he begins to see some symbolisms. He sees Jesus walking up to the elder. He sees him walking up and taking possession of this book. Notice what he said. Stood a lamb. Now, we know that's the second time since Jesus sat down on the right hand of the Father that he stood up once he went to heaven, right? And the other time was when Stephen got stoned. He stood up to receive him. Now he stands up for the second uh, recorded time. And he stands up, he said, notice that he has been slain. Well, John knows the full story about how he was slain, the cross, the Calvary, the price that was paid. And he's talking as if Jesus was still bleeding, but we know that he wasn't in his glorified body. But he still sees him because at this time, and we're going to see that it changes, at this time Jesus isn't wearing all the vesture. He isn't wearing all the crowns. He's not on his white horse. His eyes are not the eyes of fire that he turns into when he comes back as judge. He's still the Son of God. But he's taken uh, possession of this book. Notice the price was paid as if he is, but the price Jesus paid, that was the price that he paid to open the book. Who else earned the right to open that book and execute judgments except for Jesus? Who paid the sin debt? Who made it possible for lost man to get saved? And so who has got the only one that has the uh, God-given and a a birthright to get that book and execute the judgments in it? It's Jesus. And so John sees this as it's happening. And notice this. He says he has a horn. The seven horns. A horn is an imp is a, a symbol of power. A ruler. Notice this. Seven is a number of perfection. Here's what the Bible is telling us, and we read it in that other verse. Jesus can save, Jesus can destroy, Jesus can judge, but Jesus also supports. Who's going to destroy the wicked of the Antichrist? Jesus. Who sustains the church in this wicked time? He is our support, is He not? So you're going to find that everything, everything about us in this world is Jesus. Notice what He says this. His means He's got the authority. The, he's in the midst of the throne at the center of attention. Now, everything that's going on in heaven, John's focused on Jesus right now. Because without Jesus moving to God the Father, receiving that book and taking that possession of that book, nothing else moves. Heaven is at a standstill until Jesus takes that book, then heaven begins to move forward. But notice this. The Lamb is the symbol of innocence. Is Jesus not the symbol that by His blood, God sees the blood applied to our life and not us? That's the symbol of innocence, that when God sees us, He sees His Son. Slain, Jesus, listen, when Jesus took His glorified body and went to heaven, He took the scars with Him. He's got nail holes in His hand, in His feet, and in His side. Now, he was introduced to us in Revelation as a lion. And trust me, he's coming as a lion. But John is introduced him as the lamb, and he does that because that lamb is the one that earned the right to take that book. The lion is the king of kings and the one that executes judgment on humanity. 
And we'll get to all that. You see, the Lamb was His first coming. And the, the Lion is His what? Second coming. He don't come back the second time to save nobody. There's no altar. Look at verse number 7. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. Did you see that word? It's the right hand. Right hand is the, is the uh, hand of authority. Everything good? Oh, is he hurt? Okay. All right. Okay. I remembered you can't whisper with this thing on, can you? <laughs> Ever thought I have it out there? All right, notice this. We're still in the second time Jesus stood up after he sat down around of the Father. But notice that word, the right hand, which is the hand of authority. But notice that one word, took. That has a large meaning in this because God did not hand it to him. God did not courier it to him. Jesus didn't snatch it. He simply had the authority to approach his heavenly Father, reach that nail-scarred hand, hold to that book. When he did, God let go of it. And now he has full possession of the book. God the Father is now in the background. And everything from that moment forward to the rest of Revelation is all Jesus. So he's got possession of the book. And now you're about to find out what judgment is. And I'm going to tell you, if these wicked people that mock and snur God and the church and the preacher and the Bible and everything like that, if they could read this book and believe it to be true, they'd watch themselves. Because if you think my God's playing with you, you better think again. He's got no mercy and no grace in this judgment. None. Jesus will carry out God the Father's judgment on the wicked and thank you on the devil. And may I say for all them false preachers that bind the devil on a regular basis, let me introduce you to the one that can bind him for real. His name's Jesus. Look at verse number 8. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps, golden vials, full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And if you read Psalms chapter 56, verses 8 and 9, not only does God keep our prayers, God keeps our tears. So I want to tell you this, if you think for one second the prayer you thought never got answered because God never heard it, he's got it. And he will show every prayer we've ever prayed to us when we stand before him. All these around the throne fell down and they worshiped Jesus. Is this the first time we find that heaven has bowed before the feet of Jesus and not God the Father? Do you see how heaven is now recognized? All authority is given to the Lord Jesus Christ. Why did they do that? All of heaven, the spirit creatures, the elders, the saints, everybody that's in heaven, fully recognize that all, that Jesus alone is worthy and able to unfold, execute the mystery and the judgments of the book. Notice something with me, if you would. Harps. When I lived in Chicago, I knew a girl that played the harp. It's a beautiful instrument. You can't rock out to it, but does that not tell you that harps and trumpets and stuff, there'll be music in heaven? Do you think that's going to scare our dear brethren from the church of Christ? Do you know why I mention them? They don't believe in musical instruments in the church worship. They don't got them. I remember I went to one one time and I kept waiting on the piano player. Well, there is none. There's no piano. They don't believe in music in the church service because they don't believe God ordained 
music to be in the New Testament church. It's in heaven. I love music. Yes, they have this choir just like we do, but no musical instruments. One of my best friends in, in, in high school, his dad was a Church of Christ pastor. He explained all that. They don't believe in it. And the Bible tells us there's trumpets and a whole lot of stuff going on. It's going to be a great place. It's going to be our type of worship. And guess what? The cool thing of it is, Jesus will be present at every one of them. You know how we hope God shows up at ours? He's there. All right, let me just keep going. All the harps, all they all had harps, there's music, and they had vials. Now, the, Bible, the vials is telling us that prayer is like incense to God. Where did that come from? It's Old Testament. Old Testament sacrifice. They believe that if you put a sweet-smelling incense on the sacrifice, that when it came up to the nostrils of God, it would be pleasant and God would receive the sacrifice better than He would if you didn't. Because a sacrifice was simply burning meat on a fire. But they would put an incense, and in the temple you had the altar of incense where the prayers were saturated with a sweet-smelling powder. And so what he's saying is that our prayers in the nostrils of God are sweet because God tells us to pray. Believing, right? And you won't wear God out by praying. He wants to hear from us. He wants us to depend upon Him and Him alone. They had this. Prayers are like incense. They honor Jesus. Vials are simply bowls. Odors are incense. Prayers represent us sacrificing our faith in God alone. Let me tell you something. Do you pray in faith? What, Kathy? I can't hardly hear you. Yes. But do we, when we pray, do you believe there's a big difference between praying with faith and just praying just with words? All right, that's what the sacrifice of faith is when you pray. You pray believing God will. Because if you ain't got faith, why are you praying? You might as well just go through the drive through at McDonald's and tell whoever's going to enter that little voice box. You'll get it answered just as quick. Us sacrificing our faith in God alone. We should pray only to who? God. Right? Look at verse number 9. This is the one I hope we had time to get to, and I'm going a little fast tonight. Notice this. They sung a new song. That's the people in heaven. They're saying this, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Do you notice in verse in, in, in songs that we sing here, there'll be three to five verses? That's the, say it's five verses. And that's one thing I remember about Dan. Dan would absolutely not cut out one verse in a song. If it had five verses, he said, I'm singing all five. And it just perturbed him to no end when we cut a verse out of a song. Because every verse has a separate story to tell. When you cut a verse out, you're cutting out that part of the story that the song's trying to tell. So let's look at this, this way. There's five verses to this new song. It's brand new that's never been sung. It was a song that was written. It was a song that was waiting till this point in time when people got to heaven. Number one, it's a hymn. But number one, it's a worship hymn. Notice what it says, Thou art worthy. When we worship God, do we worship Him because He's worthy? Alright. But not only is it a worship hymn, but it is a gospel song. Notice what it says, The redeemed us by thy blood. Who is it that sings gospel songs? The redeemed. And I love gospel songs, don't you? It's a lively bunch. 
redeemed us by his blood. Not only is it a worship hymn, a gospel song, but it's a missionary song. Notice what he says. Sinners were redeemed. Is that not the mission of every born again child of God is to save the lost or get the lost saved? It's a devotional song. Notice what he says. Believers are king and priest in Jesus. The Bible specifically tells us we will rule and reign with him, but we are kings and we are priests. I asked that question a few weeks back. Some of the folks in here said, oh, no, we ain't priests. Oh, yes, we are. But here's the problem. When you say the word priest, people's mind goes to the Catholicism. It goes to the Catholic Church, and that's the priest that we've been force-fed on this earth. No, we're not Catholic priests. Priests are somebody that takes a person and helps them get to God. That's what a priest does. It's also a prophetic song. We are the believers, and we will reign on earth. Do you believe that? Notice what he says this. He redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred. What's a kindred? Y'all bunch of hillbillies, you better get this right. Kindred. Where do you think we get the word kinfolk from? Let me tell you two words you'll never hear in Chicago, and I know because I grew up there. Y'all's kin. Nobody says y'all. They ain't got a clue what kin means. But kindred, it simply means a common ancestor. We're all kin. Well, we're going to study the we're going to get to the word race here in a minute. It's a common as the tongue. Okay, now this you got to get this one. What is the every tongue? Thank you, language. You got it, Kathy. It's a common language, which common language simply means we all use words. All right, let's go to the next one. People. Now, Kathy, you, it's your time to shine, sister. Common. Race. We all are one race. Do you get that? There's one race of people. It ain't none of this color races. It ain't none of that. No, there's one race of people. goes back to Adam and Eve. You have ethnicities is what you have in different nations, different peoples. But there's one race of people. That's the human race. Now let me just go ahead on. It's a common race because it's people. And one nation. What does nation introduce us to what does he, what does every nation have their own government right america's got a government it used to be for the american people now it's not but they still have a government and redemption was offered to everybody when you start looking at the Bible and look at each word and what that word means, it starts to break down in commentary its own self. And he's telling us, this is who God died for. This is who is offered to salvation. Have you ever heard the term, a whosoever will salvation? That means it's for everybody. I don't care what color, what gender, what nation, what people, what nothing. God says one plan that works for everybody. And when you get out away from the book, you're going to find it gets difficult. Notice this. Let's just keep on with it. When it comes to singing, they're singing a special song that was never been written. It was, it was written for this one purpose, was one time, and they're now heaven singing it. But did the angels not sing at the birth of Jesus? Was there not a heavenly choir? Sang for the shepherds, but there was still a heavenly choir. Notice this. We're going to praise in heaven. And for the people that are just so quiet, you might want to start learning how to shout and worship and let go. 
because you are going to have one more time when you get to glory and it's shouting all as far as you can see and hear. Ain't nobody quiet. He says this, we praise in heaven, thou art worthy. That is why this new song is being sung. Thou wast slain, which past tense. He was slain, now he's worthy. He had to be slain before he could become worthy. He redeemed us. Heaven is given to Jesus. He redeemed us. What does redeem mean? Anybody ever been shopping? Redeem means to buy back, to purchase. When you've redeemed something, when you've bought it. You ever got those tickets that you could get, you can redeem this at a certain place? That means as long as you hold that ticket, that product is yours. All you got to do is present that ticket to the person at the, at the cash register and they'll get you the product that belongs to you. You just got to go receive it. That's exactly what Jesus did. He bought us at the cross of Calvary and now he's about to receive us. We're his. All right then. It, but the buy, he redeemed me to purchase, to purchase or buy back. It was paid in full. What was the purchase price? His blood and his life. Did the Father accept the purchase price? Thank you. Jesus' blood. Jesus didn't offer a sacrifice, did he? He was the sacrifice. Important to remember, mankind offers sacrifice. Jesus was the sacrifice. He was all in. All right, let me go ahead on. Notice this. Every kindred, every family worldwide, tongue means all languages. Don't matter what you speak, God knows your language. And God not only hears you speak to Him, but you hear Him. He speaks in a way that you understand Him. I have been asked multiple times over the years in my ministry, but what about them people that don't have the mind that can put words together? What about them that have this disease, that disease, that problem, that brain problem? I want to tell you something. God don't need the English language to understand you. We've got, a, we've got this in our head that God understands English only. May I tell you, that ain't the original language to start with. God understands all languages. The people that can't put two words together that you and me would understand, God hears them perfectly. Perfectly. People is all races, all genders, all humanity. I got to admit, I don't know what God's thinking about this mixed up genderism we got going on here in America, but... God looks at how you were born. You understand? You talking about we ain't supposed to look after a sign? Every baby is born with a sign. You know if it's a boy or a girl. How you get confused about it later on is beyond me. You're supposed to learn more the older you get. Every nation, every country, every state, every county, every city, every mountain, every desert, every ocean, every jungle... I have talked to missionaries and had them at churches that will tell you that people in these countries that's never even seen white people, never heard a church, never met a preacher, never opened a Bible, will tell you there is a great spirit in the sky that they know created everything. They don't know His name is Jesus, but they recognize there's a deity up in the sky where they can't see that made them. And the learned people of America are the ones that are denying Him. I'm going to tell you something. Preaching and putt-putt golf's a whole lot alike. I get madder at preaching and putt-putt golf than any time in my life. Let's go to verse 10 before I fall apart. And hast, look at that word, hast is past tense. It's going to happen. And hast made us unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on earth that means to hold an office. Notice this. Future tense, on earth, not heaven. We do not rule in heaven. We do not reign in heaven. We are not priests in heaven. 
Jesus is his own priest in heaven. On earth during a thousand year reign is when we become kings and priests and we have jobs to do. We hold an office down here because we're coming back under multitudes of lost people at the end of the tribulation period and they need somebody that can introduce them to Jesus Christ and who he really is. You don't believe it? Just keep studying the word and we'll get to it and prove it. We will represent Jesus to the unsaved. Do you think when we come back and set up his kingdom that everybody here is saved? May I tell you the judgment was against the lost. It was against the wicked. It was against those that followed the Antichrist. That is who Jesus is coming back to judge and to kill. There's no saved people at that time on earth. But if he's going to have a kingdom and rule this entire world with the people that are left, they'll need to be introduced to Jesus because they're the ones that did not follow him. I'm out of breath. Kings to carry out God's authority. May I tell you that as a Christian, you can tell somebody that they ought not say that, they ought not do that, and you've got no authority over them. But may I tell you that in a thousand year reign, you've got full authority of Jesus Christ, and they've got to do what you say. If you tell them they can't do it, they can't do it. If you tell them they can't say it, they can't say it. Could you imagine going to one of these places and telling them that they, that they can't sell beer no more? They'll laugh at you. That's money right there. And we all know the world loves money. They don't love right, but they love money. So for a thousand years, we will represent God in the thousand year reign in His kingdom. Verse number 11. This will be probably the last one. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Did y'all get that? Do you got your calculators out trying to see how many that is? Don't worry, you'll burn it up trying. All the angels are speaking. Innumerable multitude. Do you know what that is? That means it's too many to number. You think you got it figured out how many angels God has in heaven? You don't. You remember the fellow on Gadara, the demoniac at Gadara? They asked him who that unclean spirit in him was. He said, Legion. Why? Because we are many. He literally had thousands of demons in him. In one person. They can fit in a small spot. Notice this, when he says beheld, that means he looked again. Now, he said you got the voice of many angels around about the throne and the beast and the elders. A lot of commotion going on. Many angels are the inhabitants of heaven united in worship, in universal honor, and speaking as if they were one voice. Let me ask you a question. When the choir's up there singing... Is it not the goal of the choir and the choir director that all the voices unite as one voice and speak the same words at the same time? Or close? That's what he's saying. He's saying all those angels and all the beasts and all the elders and everybody in heaven is speaking the same words at the same time in unison and unity about the Lord Jesus Christ. Round the throne. When he says about round the throne, that's a central location. There's one great throne in heaven, right? God the Father sits on it. Does Jesus not have a throne at the right side of God? But does also the 24 elders not have their own thrones? We've done studied it. Not at me, yeah. That way I know you got it. And so there are several thrones in heaven, but when he's talking about around the throne, he's talking about a singular throne, which is God the Father, and heaven is now united around that throne. Notice this. Jesus stood, and heaven came to him. What was Jesus' work here on earth? He came to us. Did he not? Is it, did he not the shepherd seek out the lost lamb? 
Did he not find us where he found us is where we met him, right? Very few people ever seek Jesus. He always finds you. And so in heaven at this time, all of heaven is now seeking Jesus because he's got the book. The song has been sung. Now they all fell down to worship and they all come to where he is. They stand in there and they gathered around him and to worship. Notice this. Angelic beings, God asks you a question. Who are the redeemed in heaven? Right. Now, it's, it's not just us. Us is the church, universal, right? Does that include the first fruits? Who are the first fruits? Pardon? First fruits, those are the Old Testament saints that died, believers, and went to Abraham's bosom. Jesus set them free when he went to the grave. There's your first fruits. Now, who's the harvest? The second group of saints, the redeemed, is the harvest. Who is that? That's us. That are those that got saved from the resurrection to the rapture. Then you've got the gleanings. Who are those? Pardon? The ones that got saved in the tribulation period. The gleaning. You know what a gleaning is, right? It's when the harvest is good, you go through it and see if there's anything left. Remember what Boaz said to give to Ruth? Or Naomi? It's Ruth. Yeah, Ruth. Leave it on purpose, but all she was allowed to get was what the main harvest didn't get. It was leftovers. Well, that's the gleanings. So now you've got all three groups in heaven together and we're worshiping God. So let's look at this. Let's count the angels. Would you think it was a hundred million? I don't think it would touch it, do you? Because you're not adding thousands and ten thousands, you're multiplying by ten thousands. That means your $2 calculator that you got at the Dollar Tree ain't got enough numbers on it to tell you how many angels are in heaven. Here's the thing about it. I think that we really tend to not realize, number one, how big God himself is. Because the, because the, the Bible describes him as so big that the really heavens and heavens have to move over to give him room. That's how big God is. Please don't ever thank God the Father some little old man in a, that's just barely awake and he's ancient. No, no, no. He's big. God really had to downgrade who he is to be born in a body of flesh to die for our sins. That's when the Bible describes him as being less than the angels or lower than the angels because the angels were more glorious than Jesus was in his body of flesh. On the inside, he's still a, br a, br a brilliant God. Notice this. Thousands and thousands. Over a hundred million is too small a number. So what do, we, what do we walk away from? Don't even try to count them. We'll never get it. We'll have all of eternity to meet them. They have been described as about seven feet tall. Can take on different forms. One angel can absolutely destroy an entire nation in seconds. I don't know what God would do with the whole heaven full of them. But in heaven they'll be our friend. I'm going to quit right there and we'll pick up in verse... 12 next week. Does anybody got anything on your mind? Any questions, comments, stuff you want to discuss? Hang on just a minute. I didn't close my Bible. I didn't know we was going back to verses. Alright, verse 9. They did. All right, let's go to Revelation 14. What? Three. 
And they sung as if it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. No man can learn that song but the 144,000 which were deemed from the earth. That was a song that God wrote for the 144,000. This is their song. This notice in verse or chapter 9, it's the song of the redeemed. And when you look at the new song, it was nobody could sing it except the 144,000. Now, who are the 144,000? Correct. What's their qualifications? Male, virgins, and they are priests. There are 144,000. Now, what was their purpose to be around in the, in the tribulation period? They are... Now, when you say people, is it Jews or Gentiles or both? They are primarily for the Jews. Do y'all, I mentioned this before. Do y'all remember why God's bringing tribulation to Israel? They will not repent any other way. They are as apostate as America. I've been there. They have the same sins that we deal with in America, right down the line. The murders, not as much. It Very rarely does anybody get killed. Thievery, honey, they'll look right at you and steal everything you got, and you'll never know it till you get back to the motel and realize they stole from our group. Didn't even know it. They took credit cards. Uh, they won't allow you to carry a passport. They keep that cause, so it don't get stolen. But there was a woman that got on a camel, had her picture took, got off the camel, didn't have nothing in her pocketbook. They got her bill full, all of her money, her cash, what do you call them, traveler's checks, credit cards, and she had no idea. They can walk right past you and just steal you blind. But yeah, you're right about the new song. That song's for the 144,000. What else? All right, Hayden, what's on your mind? All right, amen. Gotcha. Proselytism? I don't know, Anthony. Because here's the thing. Number one, the Bible teaches us that there's no more Jew or Gentile when it comes to salvation. Everybody has to believe in Jesus Christ. The same salvation message applies to Jew and Gentile. What they're doing is trying to preach mainly to the Jews to introduce them that Jesus was the Messiah that they turned away and said, crucify him. We got no king but Caesar. Let his blood be on us and our children. God is putting 144,000 of those preachers out there to get Israel to understand Jesus is their Messiah. Now, can Gentiles get in on the same message? Are they going to be Gentiles in Israel? There always has been. Can they get saved through them? Absolutely. They're preaching a universal message that Jesus is Savior and Messiah. But God does this tribulation is aimed mostly at Israel. Is he not going to be their God forever and those, they'll be his people forever? That land will be his forever. And that's God's plan to get Israel to redeem. But now here's the thing. That doesn't happen until about the last week of the tribulation period when over half of Jerusalem is destroyed and the people killed. All those millions, if you will, of Jews that are around the world that will be gathered back into Israel Less, far less than half of them, maybe a third of them, is all that's going to be alive when they receive Jesus and repent. A lot of, most of them are going to lose their life. I think it's two thirds. And if you're a Bible, I'm not saying a Bible scholar, but if you're a Bible studier, you can see just from your news the spiritual condition Israel's in. They're, they're having, when, they, when Hamas came across there, they were having a pagan festival in Israel when they, when they come on did what they did. About the only time that I thought I was going to get in a fist fight, and I'm so glad I didn't, 
was if you ever mentioned the name Jesus to an Orthodox Jew that's not a believer. You do that, they will instantly fly mad and want to fight. I had a shopkeeper, and I was buying stuff from him, and I asked the question, you believe in Jesus? Buddy, Mr. Nice Guy was over, and he rant and raved, and he closed that. You leave my shop. All over Jerusalem, all over Jerusalem where the public is, are notices up with Bible Scripture that says this is why Jesus is not the Messiah. That's in Israel. If you can't identify with Jesus being your Messiah in Israel, but you notice when you read the, read the Gospels, they turned him down, did they not? They took a murderer over the one that's trying to save them. And the 144,000, I'm sorry, it's not the Jehovah's Witnesses going to heaven to, to govern the world. No, if you're asking, am I over that yet? No, I am not. Will I ever be over it? No, I will not. And I want to tell you why it gets me so mad. There's millions of people around the world that believe that nonsense. And they're going to go to a place they don't even believe exists. And they're going to raise their kids to believe the same stuff. Stuff. Any other questions? All right. Where's all them kids at? I know we got three. Yeah, I got three. Thank you very much. He's right, you brother. Oh, he can if Daddy brings him. He just knows he's going to get the go, don't he? All right, listen to me. Sunday morning, we'll have Sunday school, we'll have church service, and there will be no evening service. It's Father's Day, okay? We ain't having a dinner after church. We're just having morning service. That'll let you get to spend time with your father, okay? Are y'all ready? All right. Ryder. <laughs> they lifted holy hands toward heaven, and they shouted, Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Good boy, good boy.